Welcome everyone to this webinar with Legs Matter joining in partnership with the RCN and in particular the RCN GPN Forum. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's great we've got a very large number of people who are very interested in this topic so welcome all of you. Um, I'm going to just do a few housekeeping things. So uh, for those that are not familiar with Zoom, we have two chat functions and Q&A. And as Jilly from Glendower has also just put in saying who she is and where she's from, do put uh, some comments in the chat to say where you're from and very much welcomed. And if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A. And we will also answer them throughout the session and also um, answer them live as appropriate. So as we're talking, think about your questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A. So thank you very much. I'm just going to introduce myself and the colleagues will be introducing themselves as we go around the room. And so I'm Alison, Alison Hopkins. I'm Chief Exec uh, from Accelerate, a community interest company. I'm also a, a tissue viability and district nursing background. So that's me. And I will just ask Callum to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Callum and I'm the UK professional lead for long term conditions here at the college and an advanced nurse practitioner by background, still working in general practice. Thank you very much, Callum. Latoya. Hello, I'm Latoya. I am a practice nurse in the Midlands and I'm a committee member from the RCN General Practice Nursing Forum. Thank you very much. Penny. Hi, good evening everyone. I'm Penny. I am a clinical effectiveness lead and advanced practice lead for a community interest company in Suffolk. And I have a background in general practice and I'm also on the RCN GPN Forum committee uh, with Latoya. Thank you. Katie? Hi, my name's Katie. Um, I'm chair of the RCN GPN Forum and my background is in general practice for 20 years, but I'm currently working at Accelerate in, in London. Thank you. And Georgina? Hi, good evening. I'm George Ritchie and I'm the director of education at, at, at Accelerate Community Interest Company. Thank you very much. So we are, Legs Matter is, um, I'll be explaining uh, what Legs Matter is about, what our role is, what our mission is shortly. But just to say, we're absolutely thrilled to be partnering with the RCN uh, GPN Forum uh, tonight. So uh, with no further ado, uh, we will get on. And uh, I'm just going to introduce Penny and Latoya who are going to be just presenting on the uh, GPN forum. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Welcome, everybody. So as we've just said, yep, Latoya and I are on the RCN GPN forum committee, and we just wanted to give you um, a really brief overview of our role and some of our current work streams. So the General Practice Nurse Forum has just over 9,700 members and it's one of the larger um, forums within the Royal College of Nursing. And we aim to continue to influence healthcare policy that directly impacts on the role of the GPN wherever possible. We want to increase our profile across the four countries and listen to our members, contribute to Congress and to help shape the work of the RCM for the following year and then work on projects to support best practice. We have a very active group on Facebook. If you're not on there, please, please join. Uh, and we also are active on X and Instagram as well. So you can find us on both of those. I joined the committee in January 2021. And as a GPN with um, over 18 years experience, I wanted to have the chance to work with the RCN to raise the profile of those working within general practice and to ensure our voice was represented. I wanted to be able to engage with policy and influence policy makers and I wanted to network and engage with colleagues across the UK who had the same drive as I did. The last four years of my term have flown by with a very strange sort of wobbly start thanks to lockdowns and COVID. 
um, but the opportunities it's given me and the working relationships that I've forged as part of this role have been invaluable. So one of the largest pieces of work I've been involved in was um, promoting awareness on learning disabilities and the need to enhance service provision in primary care. The committee felt that GPNs might not be receiving adequate support and education in order to carry out learning disability checks appropriately. And we completed a survey, started to develop a resource and organised a conference to highlight the role of primary care nurses in the care of patients with a learning disability. And the clinical resources we've developed can be accessed via our forum webpage. Current projects I'm involved in include standardising job descriptions for HCAs, nurse associates and registered nurses working in general practice. We're also looking at trying to improve our web pages to make it easier to access information relevant to the role of the GPN. And we're also working on a resource linked to this very topic that we're all here to, tonight to listen to. And now I'll just hand over to Latoya, who will tell you about her work as a committee member. Hello. <laughs> so I'm so I'm Latoya. Um so I'm not seeing myself, but don't worry. <laughs> I am the newest member of the um, GPN forum. I only joined in January this year. And the reason why I joined the forum was I asked myself, um, you know, I was doing a great job with my patient population and how can I actually extend um, the my purpose when it comes to general practice so I wanted to make a difference just outside of my patient population and I saw the ad um, for a general practice nurse um, committee member I applied and it has been a really awesome uh, I've just recently come back from um, the Royal College um, Congress that was in Wales um, we yeah, we had two well-being um, fringe events. I presented on one of them. I was able to talk at Congress. And yeah, I'm also part of um, two working group. One of them was about a menopause toolkit, which we're hoping this will come out. It's, it's going to be a game changer when it comes to doing menopause review for practice nurses. And also we're working on cervical smears for people with physical disability and how we can have best practice for that. So I would encourage anyone, if you'd like to, to just have an, make a difference in general practice and to represent your um, fellow general practice nurses, definitely please come and join us. We do have vacancy presently at the moment and the deadline is the 21st of June. So please um, click on the link um, which my colleague is going to put into the chat and make sure that you apply because we definitely want to have as much representation as possible. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, I seem... Um, am I still in the program only because it says that I'm quitting Zoom, which obviously I don't wish to. I think that's uh, not not quite right. Um, anyway, but thank you very much, uh, Penny and Latoya. It was great. Um, I was just scrolling through all the participants. At the moment, we have 202, a real range from GPNs to Legos specialists to TVNs. So welcome, everyone. Uh, Kerry, if you're able to share my slides now. And I'm just going to introduce um, the uh, legs, legs Matter itself and why are we joining with the RCN Forum. So we're very excited to be working together and uh, Katie will be giving you the meat of the session very shortly. Um, we have a, a, a sort of tagline around preventing ha harm. And we have a booklet out with our 10 point plan to tackle harm. And why are we doing this? What's this about? Next slide, please, Kerry. So um, our ambition as a coalition is um, started in 2016, really, but the our annual 
get-togethers, our annual awareness weeks has started in 2018. And very simply, Legs Matter is a charity under the auspices of the Society of Tissue Viability, um, has a clear mandate to work together to increase awareness, understanding and action on lower leg and foot conditions amongst the public and healthcare professionals. That's what we're about. And it's all about collaboration. And the, um, the groups that work together are the coalition members that you see at the bottom of um, uh, this slide. So we've got Accelerate, uh, I'm from, we've got the British Lymphatic um, Lymphology Society, Royal College of Podiatry, the Lindsay Leg Club, the Society of Vascular Nurses, and I just keep having the pop-ups in front of me, um, the FD uh, UK as well, and the Leg Ulcer Forum. And we're very excited to be working together. And the good thing about this is that the um, coalition has a focus on both legs and feet. Now, patients, of course, generally just see their leg and foot as one thing. <laughs> but as you know, in healthcare, we often separate off the leg from the foot and podiatrists look after the foot and uh, district nurses look after the legs and so on. So we're trying to bring the leg and the foot together and we recognize that there are some problems in healthcare about managing their legs and their feet effectively. Next slide, please. And so we are very excited to be collaborating with the RCN GPN Forum uh, uh, this week. And we've also got other collaborations um, up our sleeve, one of which is with the National Pharmacy Association. So we've got some um, uh, uh, short film that are about to be launched um, in about conversations with pharmacists. So that I'm sure will be interesting to this group. And we've got a tons of things that are going on this week through our Leg, Legs Matter Awareness Week. Loads of stuff that other people are doing around the country. And if you do follow the hashtag Legs Matter, then you'll see loads of exciting stuff going on and loads of socks, actually. So that's quite exciting. And so I would just encourage you, if you're not familiar with Legs Matter, to go to our website and you will see an enormous array of information. Next slide, please. Why are we doing this? Because actually, we believe that there is an injustice happening for people with leg conditions. It's not prioritized the same ways as such um, pressure ulcers are. We all know that pressure ulcers are a sign of uh, avoidable harm. And it seems to be often that for lower leg conditions, it's sort of considered a sort of, oh, what can you do? It's just a natural consequence of either age or someone not doing what they should be doing for their legs. Um, often there's quite a lot of blame that goes on in the, the leg department in healthcare. And so you can see these pictures at the bottom of the slide here. We've got someone with dripping legs. We've got someone in the middle who had three very serious um, admissions for cellulitis. And then you've got the picture of their legs post effective therapy. And what we know is that there are people with leg ulcers that didn't need to have them. They started as a laceration. They started as a small knock on the leg from a Sainsbury's trolley or something. And because they don't have the care that they need, things deteriorate. And so what we're trying to do is to get to this early intervention. And so what this um, maybe this irritating graphic on the side of my slide here <laughs> is about our North Star. Our North Star is that things can be better that lower leg care can be improved and together we can do it differently. Next slide, please. So we have a 10 point plan and this is where today fits in with number three, which is give immediate and necessary care. With the support of the National Wound Care Strategy, who has um, stipulated that we can provide mild compression that's under 20 millimeters of mercury pressure, similar to a flight sock or a class one sock. Um, we can put that on 
people's legs with a quick check and it doesn't have to um, have a Doppler uh, done to in order to use these products safely. There's some information on the National Wound Care Strategy website regarding this. And so we need people to know that early intervention for legs is a priority. And this is all about gravity. And Katie will be talking about this and just explaining why a leg needs something different than an arm or an abdominal wound. We need to prioritize early injuries on the lower leg. Next slide, please. So about creating change, it's about highlighting the injustice and it's about highlighting the fact that it doesn't have to be like this. And often in our culture in healthcare, we seem to have accepted some non-healing wounds. And the language around this is often about chronic leg ulcers rather than acute leg ulcers. And it's often about um, uh, uh, poor care that could be avoided. And so we also need to promote self-management and not daily dressings all the time. There's lots of things that we can do to support people to manage themselves better and not to have to um, rely on their, the healthcare teams to provide the care that they need. And the really, really important thing that we are trying to do as a coalition is understand some the power of therapeutic compression. It's so, so powerful. So um, the next slide, please, Kerry. What we know is that there is more talk, actually, about managing leg, uh, leg wounds and foot wounds more effectively. There's the National Wound Care Strategy, and that's had a profound impact, actually, on the conversation uh, across um, England and the UK. And we do believe that Legs Matter itself, by pushing and being independent, by being strong with our wording, um, has made a difference and has a, had a role in changing this mindset. And of course, for yourselves as clinicians, the making every contact count is a very important part of this. And so leg wounds can be managed differently and they can be managed earlier that would save everyone uh, a lot of grief, actually. Next slide, please. And just to add to this before Katie talks, this is um, a, a, um, a link that's going to go into the chat. And this is also from the European Wound Management Association, a really lovely little graphic. Um, that um, just five minutes or less long uh, for you to look at and to encourage your teams to look at as well. So I will um, pause that now and I will now uh, hand over to Katie. And so this is where there's more uh, training. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. I'll just bring my presentation up. Hopefully this will work. There we go. Okay. Um, so thank you for inviting us to come and speak with you tonight. This is something that we're really passionate about on the GPN forum. And what we want to highlight during this evening is how practice nurses and other health professionals working in primary care can prevent leg wounds developing intravenous leg ulcers. We need to make a difference at the start of the patient's journey. So we have two options or two paths, you could say. Firstly, a path of harm, reduced quality of life and a painful leg ulcer. Or you can turn this around and take another path of, of helping that wound heal before it becomes complex. This will take the patient journey in a completely different direction towards healing, which is what we're all about. So this is what we'll cover over the next sort of 15, 20 minutes. Uh, we will have time for some questions at the end. Um, so just to, just to point out, we're going to be looking at identifying the problems with leg wounds presented in primary care, raising awareness of how lower leg lacerations can deteriorate into leg ulcers, understanding the impact of gravity on the leg, the role of British standard class one socks in early intervention self-management, 
and we'll discuss some of the resources available to support patient management and education. So I've put this slide on just to um, make you aware of some of the data that there is about wound care at the moment. And as you can see from the data on the slide, wound care is a core activity that's impacting on a patient's quality of life and precious healthcare resources. This data indicates that this is primary care and GPN's business, um, particularly uh, in terms of practitioner time. If you notice, there's 28.1 million practice nurse appointments per year um, looking after wounds, and, and these numbers are increasing and harm is happening. As a member of the GPN forum, I hear quite a lot of the time that GPNs don't do wound care necessarily, um, but this data does tell us differently. And although there is variability in services, we all have a part to play in preventing harm from occurring. Very often by the time patients get to district nurses or community services, they've already got a leg ulcer, which may have been prevented in a general practice setting. So we need to be part of the solution to change these figures moving forwards. So as a GPN or under the health professional working in primary care, we need to intervene and prevent new wounds developing on the lower leg. So wounds such as skin tears and stopping them from progressing to an ulcer resulting in poor patient outcomes. We do talk a lot about prevention um, in, across the NHS, but particularly in primary care. And we talk about it being a key driver, yet I question if this is the case in wound care. There's a need to make a change in what we're doing to make it more effective. So thinking about how do we as GPNs prevent new wounds changing or developing um, today from, sorry, how do we prevent new wounds on the leg today from becoming the leg ulcers of tomorrow? Venous disease is a long-term condition, but is not often viewed or treated as such in terms of the lower limb. General practice nurses have immense value in prevention, and we do that every day in our jobs with lots of chronic diseases and make every contact count. And I like this last point on the slide. I like analogies to practice nursing. And, and I, I think of it as mouth compression as being the vaccine against venous leg ulcers. Uh, I, I think that's a good way to remember it. So we need to understand why wounds on the lower limb are not healing. Well, firstly, as Alice has pointed out, it's because they're on the leg. But we're going to come to that in a little bit. Secondly, if your patient has any of the conditions listed on this slide, then they are at risk of harm and developing a lower limb wound or leg ulcer. For example, if you've got a patient with a combination of conditions such as um, poor mobility and increased age, and then you add in that uh, the trauma to, a, to a, um, a bang in the garden on the lower leg, then that's the ideal recipe for a leg ulcer. The pictures on the slide illustrate early signs of venous disease and venous hypertension. And in the top slide, there's very obvious, uh, very obvious signs of venous damage in that top picture, and the mal the valve on the bottom shows some mild swelling. And I just get you to think about your own legs this evening. Um, and are they feeling heavy at night and slightly swollen? Mine certainly are indicating I've got some uh, mild venous disease going on. So in venous disease, the pressure builds until it's got nowhere else to go and starts to leak into the tissue spaces. And this causes a cycle of inflammation, which leads to ulceration. Reduced muscle movement can lead to swelling or edema as the lymphatics are dependent on muscle movement to help fluid travel through the vessels. And accumulation of tissue fluid and blood from poorly functioning vessels is what delays wounds from healing as our skin is not able to function normally. Venous disease and swelling is a public health issue and a long-term condition for, for many. And it is a huge opportunity for health promotion and prevention in skin tears, mild swelling and early signs of venous disease. So I've kept talking about gravity, so let's have a little bit more of a think about it. So even without the risk factors, all of us are subject to gravity, constantly pulling fluid to the lowest part of us, which is the legs and the feet. And basically, if you cut your leg and you cut your arm, the arm is much more likely to heal as it's less susceptible to gravity. Compression counteracts gravity and is therefore the most basic remedy for managing leg wounds. So thinking about what we mean when we're talking about <clears throat> intermediate and necessary care with malcompression, what we're discussing here or, or um, speak, speaking about specifically is compression of less than 20 millimetres of mercury. And that's characterised as malcompression by the World Union of Wound Healing Societies. The National Wound Care Strategy has given us permission to use malcompression 
for the indications listed on this slide. This is not for everyone, however. I mean, obviously, if you had a 20-year-old um, person with no risk factors, then they should have no problems with the wound on the lower limb healing. But for those with indications of mild venous disease uh, and some of the conditions that we talked about before, thinking about mild varicose veins, varicose eczema, then mild compression would be indicated for these groups. So compression therapy is an evidence-based treatment that can help to reverse increased pressure and support healthy muscle movement by applying additional support on the outside of the skin. Where there is venous hypertension, the limb sits in a cycle of inflammation and compression therapy has anti-inflammatory properties which switches off this inflammation. Some may say it is like ibuprofen for the legs. And this image shows, shows really nicely here the, the impact that compression has when it's applied to the lower limb. Trauma is often the trigger, but is not the diagnosis uh, in terms of lower limb ulcers developing. It's the underlying venous disease that's very often the issue. And as we discussed, um, due to the location of lower limb wounds, the risk of these developing into ulceration and complex wounds can become, um, is highly likely. And then they become very difficult to heal and negatively impact on the patient's quality of life. Unmanaged swelling can create delays in wound healing and poorly managed wounds can become debilitating for patients with increased pain and extra date and reduced mobility. And you know, it becomes really difficult for the patient to keep themselves well. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this in, in clinical practice. Mild compression results in improved patient experience in terms of the faster healing rates. And in, as far as uh, sustainable health care is, is concerned, we've seen in earlier slides that wound care contributes to significant investment of time from clinicians and money from our healthcare system. So in order to contribute to sustainable health care, we all have the responsibility to it to ensure that we, we use our resources effectively. The last link on this slide is to another webinar which was produced earlier this year by Accelerate and the International Skin Care Advisory Panel, which is available for you to view and concentrate specifically on skin tears and their link to lower limb wounds. And I think someone's gonna add that link to the chat for me so you can access that if, you like to, if you'd like to. So let's think next about how we can support timely healing of lower limb wounds and prevent unnecessary treatment, infections and hospital admissions. So the answer is mild compression. Um, and this has been around a few years now. I think it was 2020 that the National Wound Care Strategy advocated that mild compression, uh, less than 20, mill 20 millimetres of mercury, without an ankle brachial pressure index, or ABPI, as we commonly call it, may increase early utilisation of this powerful treatment where immediate access to ABPI presents a barrier to commencing any treatment. Malcompression in itself might not be enough to heal a wound, but it could, what it could do is stop the, stop the deterioration whilst a full holistic assessment has taken place. Like I said, this guide was probably published in, in about four years ago. Um, but it's still really slow to be fully implemented within services. And to be honest, when I became aware of this, it was a real light bulb moment for me in terms of making a difference to the trajectory of wound progression that we often see within primary care. The significant equity in the type of wound care services that are provided within any region and even across ICBs and PCNs and following this guidance will ensure that patients get timely access to interventions which will prevent harm from occurring. So with this slide, the message here is that we shouldn't let, let leg wounds get to 14 days before assessment and intervention. And we know from working in primary care that 14 days isn't always attainable in reality. But what we can do by using mild compression and intermediate care is to create stability and slow down deterioration of the wound. Because of the barriers to completing ABPIs in many generally settings, the use of low dose compression can kickstart the healing process for the lower limb wounds and reduce the risk of a wound developing. There's a, there is a, it's likely to be enough compression for some, some parts of the population, particularly in the presence of the risk factors outlined previously, but for not, not for everybody and not everyone's going to respond. And for those patients, they will require a different approach. Lower limb wounds should show signs of healing within the first 14 days. And if there are no signs of healing, or deterioration is noted in this time, 
referral for full holistic assessment, including an ABPI, should be completed. Full assessment, including ABPI, is the route to patients accessing um, holistic assessment and going on if they need to for, for stronger um, high dose compression. So how will we safely employ early intervention with mild compression without an ABPI? That's what we've got to consider. We want to be safe. So what we need to do is check for red flags. And this is taken directly from the National Wound Care Strategy recommendations for leg ulcers. Um, those without the red flags listed on this slide and at low risk of pressure damage over brony prominences should be offered first line mild graduated compression. Those with red flag symptoms should not be offered compression as part of immediate and necessary care. However, following assessment and appropriate management by the relevant clinical specialist, compression therapy may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The recommendation for wounds that are non-healing um, is to be treated with mild compression is based on the clinical expert consensus that providing people with red flag symptoms or conditions are excluded, the benefits of first-line mild compression outweigh the risks even for people without obvious signs of venous insufficiency. What we need to check though is that there's no signs of critical ischemia. So we need to make sure that the blood is circulating easily through the arteries as this is what provides oxygen to the tissues. Checking the capillary refill time in the toes is a good indicator of a patient's peripheral perfusion. A capillary refill check should be completed distally on the tips of the toes by pressing firmly for five seconds and timing how long it takes the toes to regain its original colour. We expect, we expect this to be under three seconds in a well perfused limb. We're also going to be looking at the, the temperature of the skin or checking the temperature of the skin, the colour of the skin, and for any pressure areas over bony prominences. And if you have any concerns that you'd be referring on using your local pathways. And this image that I've popped from the slide there is of a limb with critical ischemia and you know, obviously you would not apply immediate and necessary care to a, to a leg that looked like that or a foot that looked like that. The other thing that we need to consider is that the patient's got intact sensation. And basically, you know, that's not just our diabetic patients and we're very used to checking um, um, the sensation in diabetic patients, but it can also happen uh, for lots of other reasons, such as trauma and um, vascular disorders and inflammatory conditions. So it's not about the presence of the diabetes, but the presence of the neur neuropathy that we're checking here. And we want to make sure that a patient's sensation is intact before using compression, as those with severe neuropathy may not notice if the stocking digs in or rubs causing damage. And again, if you have any concerns, you'd escalate that with the local pathways. Finally, once you check that the patient has an appropriate limb shape to wear a mild compression stocking, the material of the stocking is thin and elastic with low stiffness, and the stockings are not designed to support large amounts of swelling. And if used on these patients, they are likely to dig in and create further problems as shown in the images on this slide. We are checking for a normal limb profile, whereby the ankle circumference is smaller than the calf circumference. And if there is deep pitting edema or any skin folds, this purse would not be suitable and should be referred on for further assessment. Once we've checked and are satisfied that our patient is suitable for early intervention with compression and what compression are they allowed without an ankle brachial pressure index? Well, what we're looking at here for the purpose of this presentation is focusing on the use of compression hosiery as our first line treatment. It comes in a range of levels from low to very high, and these levels are called classes. Internationally, there's three main specifications of compression used. We've got British, French, and German, which is also known as the European standard. But for early intervention, we are looking to use a class one British standard compression sock, uh, which will not exert any more than 20 millimeters of mercury. And I've just pointed out there what, which one that is on the slide. As a general practice nurse, I've likened the British class one stocking to a brown inhaler, um, using them as a preventer to stop attacks, for example, wounds and symptoms from developing. Measuring for, measuring for a class one stocking is really simple. They typically include the same measurements. However, do check your company requirements because uh, these can vary and it depends on what products are available in your local formulary. The measurements can be taken seated or standing. However, try to measure your patients in the same position for consistency. To start, check the circumference of the ankle and this measurement should be taken just above the malleolus 
where the ankle is slimmest. The next measurement is the circumference of the widest part of the car. To ensure the correct length, a measurement should be taken from the floor to where the garment should finish, just below the knee. We also need to check the foot length from the back of the heel to the end of the big toe. Patients who do not get treatment as per the National Wound Care Strategy guidance are at much greater risk of harm. And this is usually harm through omission. And harm through omission is just as devastating to patients and families, and we, mu we must recognise it. Patients who don't, who don't receive prompt diagnosis and treatment are at high risk of deteriorating legs, of, of, of getting deteriorating leg and, and foot problems, which can have devastating consequences, physically, socially, and emotionally. And what I just wanted to highlight there is out of, out of this big algorithm that we've got on the, on the screen, that what we're focusing on, particularly where we can make a lot of the difference here, is um, using immediate and necessary care to take the patient on the different pathway which we started from. So in summary, a few key points to end on. Compression acts to reverse on gravity on the lower limb and, protects and promotes wound healing. Mild compression can form part of first-line treatment for lower limb skin tears and wound, um, wounds on the lower limb. And an ABPI is not required for early intervention with mild compression in the absence of red flag symptoms. So the answer to our question, can GPN stop leg ulcers, ulcers in the tracks? Yes, they can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. That was fantastic. A whistle stop tour um, through um, lower leg uh, immediate and necessary care. Looks like both of us now, George, uh, have lost our background. Um, we had such nice, fancy backgrounds, um, but uh, they've gone. Um, we're not sure why. It's a mystery. But we have um, eight minutes for questions. I could see that we've had a lot of uh, comments and questions around uh, the use of the Doppler, the ne necessity of the Doppler, the confusion around class one socks and that, and also a comment around having 10 minutes for wound care, which is a real uh, issue for us all. So um, where do we start, George? What question can we um, get uh, Katie and if Latoya and Penny and Callum wanted to um, uh, unvideo themselves or video so that they're, they're here, that would be fantastic. Right, over to you, George. What have we got? So I've been watching the chat box. There's been a real range of questions here, which is really exciting. There's one from Jay, actually, about the push for self-care and teaching skill ch school children about how their bodies work. Is it worth introducing leg and foot care into the curriculum? or a part of a pre-retirement course. Um, and brilliant. Does anybody want to answer that one? I've, I've got a few ideas, but over to everybody else what they think. Katie? Sorry, I was trying to mute myself. Yeah, I think that's a really fantastic idea, to be honest. Um, and maybe that's something that we need to think about trying to um, work on and implement. Um, I like your thinking and I'll take that forward. Maybe that's something we can think about um, moving forward in the practice nursing forums. So thank you for that. I think there's so many points, isn't there, Katie? Throughout the life course framework with practice nurses, um, see people, you know, at the stage of pregnancy, you know, we, we don't have to wait until people's legs are, are unwell, do we? So yeah, start even younger. Um, I've got a couple more here. So I've got one from Sarah Truin, which she says, is there any bandaging that we can use instead of hosiery for class one compression? I think this is a really good question, Sarah, and some of the answers to that might be outside of the scope of this webinar. But what Katie's told us is that in some cases, it's not appropriate to use a class one stocking. You know, if someone's got a wet, weepy leg, putting them into a stocking, it, it's going to be wet within a few hours. It's not going to be effective. So th there are some bandages that give less than 20 millimetres of mercury compression that we can put on almost as like a holding bandage. It's not going to fix the problem, but maybe to prevent some deterioration until we can do that full assessment. But those bandages do require some techniques and skills. It's not just something you can pick up off the shelf. It's something you need to learn a little bit more about. But I think it's really good that we've got that on the radar. Thank you, Sarah. 
I've just noticed, George, uh, Kate Ludlam has said, do we need uh, the class one prescribing or is it acceptable for the patient to buy them over the counter? It is acceptable indeed. People buy flight socks all the time. And weirdly enough, I used to carry around a flight sock to show people that you can buy these over the counter and nobody, nobody ever has asked anyone about diabetes or ischemia. And uh, and so they haven't been considered a hazard to the limb, which is interesting for us to think about. But also this was exactly the conversation we had with the pharmacists, so National Pharmacy Association about over-the-counter products, the fact that these can be promoted. Um, and and of course, we are actually reliant on someone having the, the, the nous enough to know that if something's painful, then they would take it off. That's what you're relying on. You're relying on them knowing enough about their bodies uh, to take off something that's painful. So you yeah. can purchase it over the counter. Yeah. You can Alison. get some really nice styles, can't you, Alison? It doesn't have to just be the plain ones. It yeah. doesn't indeed. Latoya. I, I saw someone um, put that nurses, as practice nurses, we only have 10 minutes for an appointment, which is actually true. And before I was involved um, in um, this project, I'll be honest with you, I felt the same, you know, yes, I've only got 10 minutes to deal with this wound, but you can actually in that 10 minutes while you're assessing cleaning that wound, you could be asking the patient a question so that you can rule out any red flags and harm. And as Alison said, we can signpost them and say, you know, you can buy um, a stockings from the um, pharmacy because I think this would be beneficial to you because it would help to heal you help with healing your wound faster yes indeed thank you very much uh, I mean the question I suppose we also need to ask ourselves as professionals is that often leg wounds are considered complex time consuming and people just go well I haven't got time but actually we rarely say that about other conditions and why is that? We have to ask ourselves how we've got into this sort of default setting of leg wounds um, uh, are allowed to not have the care given to them. In COVID, uh, what happened was some leg clinics were just stopped. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it's a real it's a real problem. It's a cultural thing. So in your own practice, have a think about what's what's fair as well for this group of people. A couple of things I can see the questions about K light and K plus. So K light is a crepe. A crepe is not offering any form of compression. It might um, initially offer something, but it drops off quickly. K plus is a type three A compression bandage, so would come into the mild uh, compression category. Anyone else in there? Other ones have got K two reduced. That's that's fine. Is um, anyone else picking up any questions in the chat? We've got um, two more minutes. I can just see that Amy White's just put, um, when I did the training, I was told yes, but only in the short term until a Doppler is performed. So absolutely, Amy, you, you're at a crossroads. Some people will heal with that class one intervention. Some yeah. people will heal, that will be enough. And then for your other people who are more, more complex, then it won't be enough. And so absolutely, you will need to do a Doppler and you'll need to get them into strong compression, most likely. Um, and we know, don't we, from, from some of the data that actually putting people into strong compression will save time. You know, it it, it, it frees up nursing time. Was it 38% more nursing time, Alison, in teams where strong compression was used? Um, uh, where, well, it wasn't strong. It was any compression, to be honest. Um, it was just saying that more if you... Yourself. If you put um, people into compression therapy, your workload will reduce. That's the simple um, uh, numbers, actually. Um, I've just got an email there, or oh, sorry, not an email, in the chat from Jane Parker. We've introduced an ICB early intervention pathway into the two PCNs I cover. That's really interesting. I'd be interested to know which ICB it is because that's very proactive. Um, and then one PCN has embraced it, the other hasn't due to the ambigu ambiguity in the wording. It is interesting, isn't it? How is it that good practice, uh, evidence-based practice um, is allowed to be either embraced or not embraced? You know, it's fascinating. Uh, which ICB is that? I'd love to know. 
Um, and the Doppler side of things, there's been a lot of uh, comments about, you know, basically people are saying, are you sure? Is this safe? Co um, Katie, last comment on you from um, around the safety of uh, comp um, com mild compression without using the Doppler. Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the national uh, wound care strategy is very clear on this, and even before that, it was it was it was already being noted. Um, so I think we've got clear guidance nationally that this is safe to do. I mean, obviously, you'd be giving patients the um, the what's the word um, follow up advice. If you have any problems when they're putting the stockings and taking them off, it's causing any issues, anything changes that they'll be coming back to see you. Uh, quickly and hopefully what you're hoping for if that, if that wound isn't turning around and starting to heal then the, hopefully they'll be getting in for a full holistic assessment and, and a full review in a doctor anyway that's what you've been looking for so I think it's just giving good safety net and advice that was the word I was looking for like we would with any any management there's a lot of myths and scariness about mild compression isn't there but I think we need to move past that and, and think about the harm that's being done rather than the limited harm perhaps that may be done inappropriately, which would be very rare if you're keeping a good eye on your patient and there's no red flags. Thank you very much indeed. Honestly, I think we could have gone on forever. There's so many great comments. I'm so sorry we can't answer all of these. Um, and I'm so tempted to, but it's gone um, half seven. But um, thank you very much. I think um, what I would say is if you want more in-depth stuff on this, come back to the RCN forum and to Legs Matter. Let us know what you would like. And um, you've got some great comments in the chat that I would love to have answered. So I am sorry, but um, thank you very, very much. Can I thank the RCN GPN forum uh, for collaborating with the Legs Matter Coalition to deliver this fa fabulous webinar. It will be available um, online. And the um, I believe the uh, slides will be made available in PDF format for you. Thank you very much. Thank you to each of you um, online today. Thank you.